So, uh, hardware talk. Uh-oh. This is trouble now. Um, see if I can make this thing work. So I'm going to talk about Basilisk, which is um, a fully integrated uh, accelerator for several FHE schemes uh, and is now in fabrication. And we should have parts in a little while. We'll talk about that. Um, I'm going to talk from the point of view of a company called Niobium Microsystems um, that designed this chip. Um, Niobium is taking this approach that, that FHE is a way to unlock the value of data while preserving privacy um, across a number of technologies that we're active in, which I won't go into now. We can talk about that later. But the first product we're aiming for is a fully homomorphic encryption uh, hardware accelerator that's fully integrated. And I realize that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, so I'll try to be brief. Um, some of this is going to be uh, well known to a lot of people, but I included some context for folks in the audience who might not be that uh, familiar with FHE from the user's perspective. The idea being that uh, you know if we think of this as a two-party computation, essentially. There are multi-party versions of it, which are going to be critical to success because it's a bit rare that you share data only between two parties. Uh, one that has data and one that wants to compute it on, it's going to be many parties that have data that want it computed on together. But uh, the simplified view is that a client obviously has data, uh, generates keys, uh, sends the encrypted data and the, and the evaluation keys to the server. The server then uses uh, either regular processors or uh, hardware acceleration capability to process the data and returns encrypted results. So we've seen this going over a few times today. I won't spend more time on it here. The way we view the problem is that the challenges really are sort of threefold. One is that data expands a lot when it's encrypted for FHE computation. In the standard parameters that we're using for BGB and CKKS, we're seeing ciphertext in the 20 megabyte range for uh, plain text precision in the 20 bit range. Uh, that's to achieve 128 bit security and reasonable depth. So lots more space to represent the same data. That's a problem we have to solve with hardware that's not going to just go away. A second problem is I'll call execution blindingly slow on CPUs and GPUs. A lot of work we've seen this morning is to address some of that, which is great and critical to do. Uh, we have to do that extra work to manage encrypted computation, and we also need uh, fast and big uh, additions and multiplications to actually do the computation itself. So whether it's bootstrapping or whether it's uh, the actual computation, all that's too slow. We know that. Uh, we need to accelerate by probably a factor of 10 to the 4th, 10 to the 5th to be practical for use uh, over where we are today. And the third thing that's critical here, I think, is ease of use. Um, you heard some of the talks this morning, even, even the very first one this morning, where uh, the encoding of that problem was complicated for regular programmers. So the programming style is unfamiliar, and there's a lot of complicated trade-offs between security, precision, and speed. So toolkits that work with this hardware are going to be key to success. So how do we try to solve for those challenges? Um, several things we're doing. One, chip, one thing to accelerate uh, and improve on memory utilization is we're doing on-chip generation of what I'll call management data to really uh, try to boost performance by reducing memory bandwidth limitations. So one is that uh, the twiddle factors for the megacyclic NTTs we use are generated on chip by our accelerator rather than pulling them out of memory somewhere. A second factor is the key switching keys are the same. You can generate the half of the key switching keys that rely on multiplication by random numbers by generating those random numbers on chip and not having to pull that half of the keys from memory. So we do both of those things. Uh, we also have uh, gone a long way towards uh, making NTTs more efficient. Why? Because typically what you have to do uh, one part of the NTT, then you have to transpose the matrix in memory, and then you do the other part of the NTT. Well, uh, we have custom on-chip memory designs that are aimed at uh, doing two-dimensional access with no delay and no need for transposition by combining sort of a clever design in the on-chip static RAM area uh, with reuse of the automorphism shifters uh, that together lets us do transposition for free on the fly. And then finally, we have a specialized Montgomery modular bootstrapping approach that reduces chip area and power significantly uh, by being able to use mod Montgomery modular arithmetic in the uh, multiply and add units uh, to make those more efficient in terms of area and power. Uh, and then um, a lot, of course, of the benefit we get is highly parallel modular arithmetic. So we have on-chip uh, 
we're, we're dealing with uh, double CRT representations where the little Qs are all 64 bits or less, uh, so 64 bit modular arithmetic or thereabouts on, over primes. And we have 1,024 of those data paths running in parallel, so we can process a uh, full 64K kind of ring dimension in a small number of cycles. This overall set of speed ups is coupled with a RISC architecture. It's a load store architecture that has about 25 instructions in its instruction set. We only have one data type on the entire chip. That's the residue polynomial. That's all we have to deal with. That makes life easy. Uh, we have only two addressing modes. We don't use caches, for example. All we have is register addre addresses and immediate operands. So the entirety of memory is actually addressable space as a large register file instead of having to manage caches and cache tags. That greatly reduces the amount of wasted space in memory uh, because all that's available to us at compile time to define. Okay. Hmm. What do we support? We support right now three schemes, BGV, CKKS, and BFV. Um, TFHE, the mathematics are the same for us, but uh, the question is whether our ring dimension can be optimal for the uh, small ring dimension for TFHE. So in terms of parameter ranges, we support plain text modulus uh, up to about uh, a reasonable size for, for most applications uh, that we've seen so far. Our, pri our preferred ring dimension is 2 to the 16, which gives us 128-bit security uh, capability on those schemes for reasonable other parameter choices. Uh, we can be uh, using ring dimensions smaller than that, but that's the most efficient spot in the, uh, in the hardware selection. Of course, we don't have the, the flexibility you, you would expect maybe in a, in a software solution. We have to live with things that are somewhat limited because of the hardware design. So that puts our ciphertext modulus uh, big Q in the 1800-bit range. Uh, but can go as small as 20 bits. Uh, and our native math is, like I said, up to 64 bits, based on 64-bit or less primes for, for the little Qs. Uh, that does let us do a little more than 128-bit security, which we consider uh, the minimum necessary. Uh, and our native operations are fairly small. As I said, there's only about 25 instructions, uh, and they're all the ones you would expect. Uh, add, multiply, NTT, inverse NT NTT, and automorphisms, and a few other things that are uh, really processor control instructions mostly. So it's a pretty simple machine from the architecture point of view. So how does this get deployed? Uh, we'll talk in a minute more about what's on the chip um, in terms of structure, but the chip will be built into a package and for this generation, the package will sit on a PCIe version 4 card uh, attached to a by 16 uh, PCIe 4 uh, bus that talks to the host, and that can be plugged in then to a standard PCIe slot, X16 slot, in a single board server. So that's the deployment to customer. Pretty simple. It's no big iron, there's nothing special. You can put this in uh, a desktop or uh, a blade kind of server. Let's talk a bit about the architecture just to give you more of a uh, visual feel. So what you see here is um, the core accelerator, which has uh, a ciphertext buffer. We have a 64 megabyte on-chip static RAM buffer. Because why? Because this is all about memory bandwidth, like it or not. Uh, so 64 megabytes here. This is the, the, the cleverness I just talked about before that gives you two-dimensional access to improve uh, NTT performance. That feeds the processing elements. Uh, we have, I can't show you the die plot, and the why is because uh, that hasn't been approved by the government who actually fabricate, is paying to fabricate the chip, so I can't show you the pictures. But there's two major things you see when you look at the die plot. Uh, one is the multiply accumulate data path. You can think of that as a digital signal processor MAC kind of uh, set of data paths, 1,024 of them in parallel, operating all at once. And then uh, a large uh, 256 by 256 NTT to be able to process the 16K ring dimension NTT quickly. So the uh, multiply accumulate logic is distributed among the 64 megabytes of, uh, of the ciphertext buffer. And then the NTT, because you can't really distribute that well into a RAM structure, sits at the bottom of the chip. Now beyond that, uh, there is the traffic control unit that actually issues instructions to all this. And there's actually a RISC-V core. And if you actually look at the die plot, it's interesting. 
There's a RISC-V CPU core that controls issuing instructions to everything here, and it's barely visible. It's this tiny little square in, in a much bigger chip. Uh, one thing I can say about the chip is um, it is about the size of an Apple M1, so it's quite large uh, and uh, has something like 20 billion transistors on it. Uh, so beyond uh, the core of the accelerator, we have twin DDR channels that are operating in uh, 3200 mode, so DDR4s, and then we have an X16, that is 4x4 uh, PCIe channels that operate to, to the host. So here's the, you can see the RISC-V core that issues instructions to this. That's the rest of the complement. Of course, the DDR channels are all our third party IP, and they uh, run down one side of the chip, and at the very bottom of that one side of the chip, we see the third party IP that is the PCIe uh, bus. Internally, we use a, a, a typical AXI bus uh, layout and architecture for communicating between all that IP and our uh, DMA engines that control moving data in and out of the ciphertext buffer. So that's a real quick view of the architecture. The software stack, I won't go through all this, just to say that uh, on the left you can think of that as the, the client side stack, uh, starting with uh, uh, right now a preferred parameters guide, but coming soon will be uh, a, an optimization tool meant to help choose parameters wisely. And there we have key generation and then encryption decryption utilities as part of this, the SDK that will go to the client side for deployment. And then uh, obviously the compiler operates over there, but we're also gonna be compiling on the server side. Why? Because the executables, it turns out, are so large that we can't actually realize the program in an encapsulated uh, binary that you could actually ship over the network. So we'll be using on the server side uh, a dynamic compilation step that interacts with the device driver, and the device driver will then feed instructions piecemeal to uh, the hardware, and also control sending uh, ciphertext to the hardware and retrieving them. So we'll run operations, uh, applications in Windows. Whatever fits into the size of the installed DRAM at runtime will be shipped over. That window of the application runs dynamically, feeding instructions as they're generated and as they're needed. And then at the end of a window, the device driver will retrieve back into host memory the partial results and issue the next window out to the processor. So the device driver is actually a lot more complicated than a typical PCIe device driver. But this stack, the compiler and uh, the Niobium code generator and then the Niobium device driver will drive the hardware. The top part of the stack is gonna be uh, aimed to be compatible with HEIR and MLIR, so what you heard Jeremy talk about earlier today is what we aim to use there. And we use the OpenFHE library right now as our target for generating our backend code. We actually take a snapshot of OpenFHE and pull it out and augment it to generate our AST, and from that we generate our instruction traces. And that's what we feed to the device driver that feeds to the hardware. So that's a quick view of the software stack. In terms of availability, the plan is that um, our early access program opens up in summer 2024 as we get uh, starting to engage clients with the SDK and helping them understand their uh, application issues and how to get those things started. Um, and then we intend to, uh, later in the year, uh, give client access to the actual hardware uh, on our premises as early as early 2025 and then for select clients we'll make that hardware available later in 25 to mid-year or something like that uh, with boards in hand of the clients. Uh, but we do expect silicon this summer. As I said, the, the chip is in fabrication now. The fabrication is taking a little longer than usual because this is a multi-project wafer, wafer project that is uh, fabricated in a 12 nanometer global foundries process and the government global foundries uh, uh, shuttle it departs only twice a year. That's what's running now, and it doesn't have quite the priority of fast runs at Global Foundries. So we'll be waiting until about August, early August, most likely for chips. It might come in July. And from there, we'll be powering on, and then we intend to have, like I said, application results measured by late fall. Um, so that's really roughly our availability. Um, we definitely want to acknowledge our roots on this. Um, this work was heavily funded initially by the uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. 
they paid for the development of the, of the design and uh, the running of uh, performance benchmarks to qualify us and then paid for the fabrication of the wafers. Um, that is now going to be going into transition to product through Niobium funding, through venture capital that's already been landed. So we'll move on from there. But we really do appreciate DARPA's involvement and continued involvement. And the benchmark results I mentioned that we'll have late this fall will be in partial fulfillment of the remainder of the DARPA deprive program where we'll be providing those benchmarks as specified by uh, the government and give them the results back. So we have uh, the initial round of benchmarks will be uh, a logistic regression, a neural network, 17 layer neural network uh, training regime, and a neural network inference regime. So those are the three primary benchmarks for this fall. And I think that's what I have. Maybe, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. There must be quite some questions. Start with. I knew you'd have a question. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of questions, but we can talk over lunch. Um, so could you say more about how big the compiled application binaries are and how that, or how that compares to the size of the window that can go onto the chip? Sure. So uh, we had no problem actually compiling a 5,000 point logistic regression down to a, an executable file that would fit. But when we looked at the CNN inference benchmark, uh, we found out that we couldn't actually write a two gigabyte file. It was too big. There's nothing we could optimize over that, so it, it was just too big to write and then too big to ship. So um, that has nothing to do with the window size. We, we, we don't ship, we don't use the majority of that DRAM for instructions. We piecemeal those out through a pipeline over PCIe. The memory is almost all uh, aimed at data. So the windows are dominated by the size, the number of ciphertexts and the size of the keys. Uh, not the number of instructions. Make sense? I knew he'd have a question too. How do I know that? So, so just to understand your architecture, so you have this large amount of space, which is the ciphertext space, which is, they're just, they're just like ring elements, yeah? Right. Okay, and then your registers are indirect memory allocations into that, into that ciphertext file, and then you're doing like indirect memory Allocation. So if you add, you're kind of adding register A, register B, register C, and that's actually memory locations into the into the into the, the ring element part of your chip, yeah? Right. Okay, so how many registers do you have? So so the <laughs> so what, what was that? That was answer. Uh, eighty megabytes we have on chip? Sixty four. Sixty four. So think think in terms of this. We have sixty four megabytes of static RAM on chip, and that's enough to um, I'd have to do the math in my head. Yeah. So, so think about th think of it this way. So, uh, each register we talk about is uh, a uh, polynomial or part of a polynomial. So think of it as 60 dimension 64k uh, by uh, the depth of one of the limbs. Yep. So whatever whatever of that fits in the 64 megabyte is what we have on board. I think it's 8k of them actually. Yeah. Is our, depends is how, you, how you count. Yeah, yeah it depends on you, but I think it's 8196. So the probe, you were talking about you had indirect memory access. So the so you had the, the, the you had your big block of memory, which was your ciphertext, your ring elements, uh -huh. and then you had the small bit on your diagram, which I presume was the registers, which are which are like saying. No. Position one, ah, position two, and how many of them question. do you have? Yeah. So no. So think of it as just a, a layered memory hierarchy. There's the on-chip 64 meg, right, which turns into like 8K, right, ring elements are, are just uh, data. They're not pointers. They're, just, they're not in direction. So we just allocate the different layers by compiler. So what we'll do is we, we manage the on-chip as if it was a cache, but we don't have to manage as a cache with cache tags. We actually allocate registers and move data proactively. So there's no indirection. It's actually a small memory backed by a big memory, backed by host memory. Okay. Yeah. okay? Yes. yes. And the smallest units, there's like first thousand, two thousand little units, right. multiply accumulate units, they all operate in parallel. Right. These days it's called compute in memory. Right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh. yeah, first there. Oh, go ahead. So um, I'm just I'm kind of curious about like the product decision process. So um, something that happens in crypt. Okay, so hardware acceleration for cryptography like works out great for everyone if the crypto that we're accelerating is like really stable. 
Right. Like, how did you decide that FHE is ready to put in silicon? We didn't. The government did. Oh, right. <laughs> yes. this, no, the, ser seriously, the, the, simple an the simple answer here is that the government said, we're going to fund this major program in developing hardware acceleration for FHE. And we care about BGV. Now, some more into the program, I'm not speaking for them, by the way, I'm just speaking my observations. Um, they said, oh, we really care about CKKS too, can you add that, please? Now, TFHE, for example, was not on the table at all. In fact, we originally proposed to do that, and they said, nah, don't, don't want to do that. So we followed their direction because they provided the money. Now, the real question is, how do you go from there to product transition? So I would answer it this way. It is not clear to us yet that this chip is a product. Now, seriously, it, the question is, what does the market develop? The way, the way I look at the FHE market is that there is no market. There is no market, full stop. You have to create that market, and you have to find a place for chips like this in that market. Now, if it turns out that this chip comes back, is functional, I hope it's functional, um, <laughs> and, and, and then has interesting performance that people are willing to buy, then we say, oh, that's a product. Let's ship it. We may have to do a mini pass because there's some things about testability that aren't on the silicon, right? Um, so, stop with that. If it's not that interesting, then we say backup tier. Oh, this is a prototype that people want to have in hand so they can see what FHE can do with acceleration. Cool. We ship a small number of those and we do the next generation product and the architecture of that is already underway, by the way. Um, the third backup is, well, we can't really find the market. It doesn't exist yet. So this is a demonstrator, and then we work further at identifying the market, and that informs our next generation. So this may be a prototype. Uh, it might be a product if the market emerges around it. Okay, cool. Hi. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Sure. One question is uh, uh, regarding the uh, main memory choice. Uh, I think the uh, current choice of uh, uh, using DDR for the main memory may be, uh, may be still slower if we, we consider the uh, large volume of key bootstrapping key access. Right. And maybe HBM is better uh -huh. for uh, addressing this issue. And also, uh, uh, yeah, uh, wh why do you choose uh, DDR? And another question is, uh, I think you mentioned the use of uh, 12 nanometer process for right. this ASIC, and uh, why that kind of generation is chosen. Okay, yeah. great questions. So the DDR question is, is, is a complicated one. Um, certainly HBM would have given us more bandwidth, no question, but the density of available HBM memories is like 1 16th of what you can get in terms of the depth of a DDR. So we'd have to go with much smaller onboard memory complement um, but it would be much faster. So we traded that off, and there was another complication. The third-party IP availability in 12 nanometer LP plus GF technology of HBM2 versus DDR. So we looked at all those things, and we had to make a guess. We had to make a call. And this call was made before there was any discussion of actually productizing this thing. So we said, okay, for the purposes of assuring that we can deliver to our sponsor, the government, the best working thing that can demonstrate the power of FHE, we're going to go with the thing we're sure of, DDR4. Uh, will there have to be another generation? Yes, but we couldn't get the IP, and then we felt that the bigger memory complement would be a better demonstrator, prototype, than the smaller memory complement of HBM2. Okay? So that's that answer. Um, why 12 nanometer? That answer is easy. That's what the, the shuttle from the government's availability was 12 nanometer LP+. Plus. We're done. We have to use that technology. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't, it, you know, it wouldn't have made sense to go to seven anyway, it's just too expensive. Because um, if you think about going to seven, you probably know this, right? The, the cost of a mask set in seven nanometers is going to be $15 million. That's a lot of money. In 12 LP plus, it's a lot less. So I think they could probably afford it more easily, and if we have to do spins, we can afford it more easily. So beside the improvements in running time, do you already know what to expect in terms of uh, power consumption? Right. So our initial uh, estimates of power consumption based on simulation, of course, uh, in like the, the logistic regression benchmark is that this chip will be in the sub-100 watt range, like 85 watts. 
No, but in terms per operation. So if you want to run a certain uh, computation uh -huh. using, uh, for example, standard uh, CPU, of course, yours is going to be faster, uh, it's going to burn faster, but uh, for the full computation, uh, no, uh, sorry, what was your number? Uh, sorry, say, say again? No, so, so ju just to come, I, I don't know what can you do with those many watts. So just compared to CPU, so is there an um, improvement in computation per watt? Um, you know, actually, we have, well, yes, because, I mean, this is very rough numbers, because that number of 85 to 100 watts is not too far different from a leading edge like a Xeon Silver Class CPU anyway. So, and our benchmark performance simulations, again, using a cycle accurate simulator that we developed, not by just counting operations, but rather writing a simulator from discussions with the microarchitects, one of them sits right there. Um, uh, we ran the, the benchmarks on that, and we show a speed up of, depending, I mean, your mileage may vary, but in the, on the order of a few thousand. So you can think of that as probably a, a computation per watt improvement that's in the same range, but I don't have any solid numbers to give you on that yet. No, no, yeah, just, just a rough estimate. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Can, can the chip also be used for dual use purposes, like to accelerate crypt analytic so of uh, the crypto system that rely on these operations that you accelerate? So you're asking about things like uh, uh, post-quantum, um, yeah, like signature like schemes? Kyber. Right, like Kyber, and, exactly, like Kyber and dilithium, right? So we looked at that. So one thing to say is the ring dimension for Kyber and dilithium is much, much, much smaller than 64K. So the answer is we can do it, but it'll be very inefficient compared to what you could get if you had customized hardware that did ring dimension 64 or something, right? So the answer is probably not great for that. Now, we already know that in the next generation architecture, we're looking to a lot more flexibility in ring dimension. One reason is for scheme switching support, right? And another is exactly what you talk about, and things like um, uh, zero knowledge proofs, right? So, um, and TFHE, which is going to typically have a ring dimension that's significantly smaller than 64K. So, in the next generation, yes, not so much in this one. Um. Most FHE applications are memory intensive, and right. moving data is expensive. Right. So, how much speed up would you, you know, expect from a full program perspective rather than individual operations compared to CPU? So, so um, several things to say there. One is, um, well, so far what we've seen in the simulations says for full applications like logistic regression or like even CNN inference, order of a thousand, a few thousand, right? Um, but that's because, one, we can, uh, at compile time, know where every memory piece has to be at the right time. So we're not stuck with cache miss rates that might be weird, right? Um, and two is we focus a lot on efficient use of memory bandwidth. This may be better for what we're doing than for a, a general purpose processor. So most of, it <coughs> excuse me, most of it is indeed about memory bandwidth. And so this is why, as I said, the next generation, to the earlier question, we'll very likely use a hybrid uh, HBM2 to get you know, speed and then have a, a second backup which is DDR5 or something like it for capacity and then even more memory on chip. But given ciphertext sizes in the 20 megabyte range, you're still going to have a small number of ciphertext on chip at any time, maybe a few and maybe part of one or two key switching keys. So it is all about memory bandwidth and so some of the optimizations we have there, like generating key switching key halves on chip and generating NTT uh, uh, hint factors on chip or twiddle factors rather on chip, that's all aimed at, at memory bandwidth uh, reductions. It's all about memory bandwidth. Yeah. Cool. Last question. <coughs> how would the market look for the, how would the consumer market look, at, what's the outlook in the consumer market in the next few years for these FHE accelerators? Well, so the answer is, um, I would claim that nobody knows. And, and, and any you know, sort of market prognosis about that is probably a little flawed. We've been talking to, uh, obviously, a lot of people who are trying to turn this into a product. And there is what I'd call an, uh, lots of interest. I'm interested in what FHE could do for me and, and will I need acceleration or not. But there's very few people willing to sign, like, here's a letter. We intend to buy these things from you. So I would say uh, it's unknown. We, we're still trying to discover it. Okay. Uh,
Thank you for the presentation. Again.